All right, I see that we're at the top of the hour and Eve has prompted me to start the uh, start the discussion. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for attending in advance. Uh, certificates are gonna be sent at the end of the uh, end of the presentation. And uh, should you have any, any questions or concerns, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Eve. Uh, you can reach out to Eve either by uh, emailing her at eve at lagoons.com or you should be able to reply to some of the correspondence you received on uh, on this webinar or any of the other ones and ask any questions that don't get don't get caught up with here. Uh, likewise, if you have any issues with your certificate or have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'll we'll be happy to get that set up for you. So my name is Ben Shackman and I'm the Midwest Regional Manager here at Triple Point Environmental. I cover 13 Midwestern United States and three provinces of Canada. And I'm very excited to be talking to you all today about nitrification and cold weather and reviewing a couple of years worth of case study, case study information that we have on, on a couple of systems we're running, a couple of the 30 plus we're running. So let's, uh, let's take a look at an agenda first. There we go, there's the agenda. Uh, so just a quick overview of what all we're going to be talking about today. And at the end, I am going to uh, have a slide on our Lagooniversity. It's 100% free. It's something that we started during the pandemic in an attempt to give back a little bit to the industry. And I look forward to sharing that information with you as well. But we'll jump in with a quick introduction of me um, here in the St. Louis area. Sun shining. It's a nice day here. <clears throat> I've uh, I've been knocking around water and facilities for uh, the better part of the last decade. And high purity utility water, wastewater, uh, dealing with regulated substances, RECRA regulated facilities, and and the likes. And spent about 26 years, a little over 26 years in the Army before. Uh, my wife and I live in the St. Louis area. We travel extensively, and uh, we are empty nesters at this point. And that turns out to be just tremendous fun. I, I recommend it to everyone who has children. At some point, get rid of them. Send them to college. Send them to the workforce. Get get back to enjoying life. Uh, that's completely off script. But looking at Triple Point now, uh, Triple Point has been well recognized as one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. And you know, we've been recognized regionally as well. And you know, the old saying, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a door, beat a path to your doorstep turns out to be true. And you know, on the screen now is our project history going back to uh, 2003 on the screen. And you'll see a low flow rate of about 5,000 gallons a day and a high flow of 13 million. Uh, we do a, about a 50-50 mix of municipal and industrial projects in any given year. And, a lot of the industrials show up with non-disclosures and don't make it onto the list, but you'll, you'll see more municipals on the list as a result. So we are going to talk today about nitrification, and there are a bunch of different ways that different companies have come up with to accomplish nitrification as a tertiary process for a wastewater treatment lagoon. Uh, Nitrox is the triple point solution, and it's technically described as a tertiary, thermally regulated, moving bed biofilm reactor. Excuse me, I missed nitrifying. Uh, nitrifying belongs in there as well. Tertiary, thermally regulated, nitrifying, moving bed biofilm reactor. An MBBR for all intents and purposes, just tuned to get different performance out of it. Our installations are on the uh, screen now. On the right side is our process guarantee when we install a nitrox we guarantee that it's going to achieve what what we say it will and uh, we've got a good number of these in the ground already and have been operating for a number of years fort pierre south dakota represents a brand new state for us and a brand new installation coming up in fort pierre uh, we also have a couple of rental units that are running and one is running one is being built uh, for an industrial customer over in south dakota so when I give this presentation next time, I'm going to have to expand that map to uh, to get those get those systems called out as well. All right, uh, that that's about it as far as company stuff, and we're really going to dive deep into uh, 
into the use of an MBBR for nitrification now. And we're going to discuss nitrification in, in really cold weather, really cold water. So some background, some history, if you will. MBBRs, they date back to the 80s. They were developed in Scandinavia. There are thousands of these things around the world. And they are just heavy lifters when it comes to BOD removal. And you get some nitrification taking place in them as well. Uh, there's at least 25 years of data out there to support the idea that Yes, you can nitrify in an MBBR. And independent research studies after study has proven uh, that MBBRs do nitrify. Uh, cold climates reliably treating down to uh, temperatures as low as 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit, which is four degrees Celsius. And that sounds like cold weather, but or cold water, excuse me. That sounds really cold. I mean, 39.2 or 4C. That, that's definitely colder than, than we generally think about microbial activity taking place and being active and you know, modeling it. But the reality and what you're gonna see in this presentation is that 39.2 degrees isn't even close to being a barrier and that nitrification can and does continue well below that, well below that. So while current, current research is focusing on uh, nitrifying MBBRs at the back of the plant at the very end of a lagoon system. And temperatures there, a lot of times we're seeing all the way down around one degree Celsius. And we're seeing really, really low uh, effluent CBOD and TKN. I mean, we're, we're seeing numbers below one milligram per liter in the dead of winter uh, coming out of MBBRs on the end of, end of lagoon plants. It's just a beautiful conversation to have, and it's great to be able to disrupt conventional wisdom a little bit. And you know, I, I'm excited to share this with everyone on the uh, on the call today. So, a little more background: ammonia. It's a compound of nitrogen, and hydrogen. I think if anyone has ever smelled a, an area where homeless have clustered, or you have a cat at home with the litter box you don't get to as as frequently as you'd like to, you you know the smell of ammonia. You know that 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 powerful offensive odor that it produces. Um, and you know it's important to note that when in water, most of the ammonia is converted to the ionized form ammonia. Uh, NH3, NH4 shown on the screen there. Minor difference, still just nitrogen and hydrogen. We're going to dig a little deeper into this and, and talk about the different forms of nitrogen next. So NH3 and NH4, that's very generally described as ammonia nitrogen. And if we expand this a little bit, we'll, we'll roll in here with the uh, nitrite and the nitrate. And when we think about the organic nitrogen, that has to be discussed as well. So all of these microorganisms that are floating around in the ponds, they, they all have some amount of a bunch of different uh, nutrients locked up in their cellular walls, their, their bodies, their structure. And as they die and, and fall to the bottom of the pond and become part of that sludge blanket that lives in the bottom of these ponds, uh, there is the potential for re-release. A lot of times that's referred to as feedback. And very specifically, when we're talking about ammonia feedback, it's benthyl feedback. So when we look at all of these forms of nitrogen, we're, we're talking now about total nitrogen. But that's not, the only, that's not the only description that we wind up using. Sometimes we have to talk TKN, total Kendrell nitrogen, named after Johan Kendrell. Uh, and that is NH3, NH4, plus that organic component, the nitrogen and nitrogen that's locked up in the cell walls of those organisms. It excludes the nitrate and the nitrite, nitrite and nitrate, excuse me. So looking at it a little bit more differently yet, we can talk about total inorganic nitrogen. As you might guess, the inorganic portion excludes the organic. So now we're talking NH3, NH4, nitrite and nitrate, T-I-N now. And that is a pretty deep dive into the different forms and categories of nitrogen. So it begs the obvious question, why? Why do we care? Well, the biggest reason is because it turns out that ammonia is really toxic to fish. 
it, it doesn't harm us. We have organs in our body that have the ability to process and, and, and expel uh, ammonia. We, we can eliminate it. Fish can't. It bioaccumulates. That says that each, each milligram or portion of a milligram of ammonia that enters a fish's uh, bloodstream, enters a fish's body, is going to stay there. It, it will ultimately, as enough of it accumulates, kill fish and amphibians. And if, uh, if it's allowed to go on unchecked, we're going to see reductions in fish quantities and sizes, more than just what you're going to hear about on the next slide that I find incredibly shocking, uh, the, the dead zone. That's coming up on the next slide. But I love fishing. I'm guessing there are a lot of folks in the audience today that love fishing. You've got a picture of me and my wife, one from uh, Wisconsin, one from Minnesota, and some fishing we've done recently. But the idea that our favorite fishing holes could become a thing of a past, oh, what a terrible, terrible thought. We definitely don't want that happening. So expanding on this, expanding on the idea of bioaccumulation and, and toxicity, acute toxicity, to fish and amphibians. On the left side of the screen, uh, NOLA published that, but you can find it on NOAA's website also. That's a visual depiction of the oxygenation in the Gulf of Mexico off of New Orleans and the study area that's being looked at and has been studied since 1985. That's the chart on the, on the bottom left, uh, the bottom water area of hypoxia where you've got so little oxygen that like the scuba diver pictured in the center of the screen on the bottom, you're not seeing fish, you're not seeing plants, you're seeing algae, you're seeing green, you're seeing that really nothing that can be commercialized is growing there, nothing that can be that can feed a population is growing there. We have effectively killed that off at this point. And looking at the chart on the left, you'll see that there's some variation in the in the size of the dead zone. It definitely changes. That's square miles in thousands of square miles. Unbelievable. So why? How? How? Well, first of all, uh, about 300,000 pounds of NH3N is rolling down the Mississippi River every year. And if that were used as fertilizer instead of, instead of you know, being discharged in our waste, you could grow the equivalent of 145 million tons of corn. And that's a lot of corn. That's a whole lot of corn. It, it's enough corn that I have a hard time conceptualizing 145 million tons of corn. But if you think about it in terms of train cars full of corn and a train, a very long train that circles the earth, 145 million tons of corn in train cars circles the earth twice. Wow, that's a lot. That is a lot of nutrients. So in 2020, we were all the way down at 2,117 square miles, according to NOAA. Uh, but NOAA goes on to call out the fact that Hurricane Hannah stirred up the Gulf of Mexico and pushed populations around and changed oxygenation and changed migratory patterns. And it's not really down that low. We can see that on the left in 2021, uh, Hurricane Hannah. Had a, had a disruptive uh, effect on, on the measurement of the size of, the dis, size of that dead zone. In five-year average, it's all the way up at 5,400 square miles. That is just a gigantic chunk of the ocean off of our southern coast that no longer grows fish, no longer grows aquatic life because of all of the ammonia, all of the nutrients, and phosphorus plays a role as well, but this is a conversation about, about ammonia and nitrification rolling down the Mississippi River and, and creating this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So if, if ever there was a compelling reason why this, this should be addressed, I think that this dead zone is, is a good indication of it. And if we take a look at that dead zone, we think about why the nutrients so concentrated down in the Gulf of Mexico. First of all, about 40% of our country drains into the Mississippi watershed, but all watersheds are impacted. And the conversation about point versus nine points is so, so interesting to me. We're, we're talking primarily about point sources. We're talking about wastewater treatment plants. 
Wastewater treatment plants are very well regulated, very well controlled. The EPA, the state agencies know exactly where they are, exactly what they're doing. They all have reporting requirements. They're really well known and easy to track. Industrial users, they're a point source also. They're a little bit more onerous when it comes to implementing limits and asking them to restrict. Now, I'll tell you that I worked on an industrial project that was discharging into a major river, one of them that's shown on the screen right now. Their discharge permit allowed them to put 400 milligrams per liter of NH3N into, the, into that river, that receiving stream. I don't think there are very many municipalities out there that get anything like a 400 milligram per liter effluent permit limit for ammonia. But industry is just simply treated differently. Industry has powerful lobbies. They have the ability to, to sway Congress. Uh, farmers, non-point non -point contributors to, to the issue. Again, very powerful in front of Congress. Very, very big voice. And uh, that leaves us. That leaves, that leaves the small municipalities out there running point source, uh, point source distribute, excuse me, point source affluent as the easiest, the most accessible to control. And as the United States is trying to suppress this nutrient in, in the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, getting rid of these dead zones, it becomes very, very easy to reach out and touch these small municipalities, these, these communities. And there are just tons of them out there. About a third of all of the wastewater facilities in the United States are lagoons. That's municipal industrial combined. They're highly concentrated in the Midwest. You'll see, you'll see lower numbers in other states. Best estimate has about 8,000 of them out there in the field operating right now, with about 60% of that number being facultative lagoons. And facultative lagoons are just great systems. They, they, they really and truly are. When you think about a big hole in the ground and you dump nasty water in on one end, and a couple, three, four months later, maybe on the other end, you get not so bad water out of it. You know, certainly water that you can add to a receiving stream and not kill all the fish in it or, or poison everyone downstream or anything like that. that. That's pretty nice. Where facultative lagoons really, really struggle, though, is nutrient removal. And a lot of times it requires a tertiary process or an, an external process to be added to their treatment in order to enable them to nitrify all winter long. Because that four and a half or five degrees Celsius absolutely applies to facultative lagoons. We're going to dig deeper into biomass size and all of that as we get into the presentation. But I just want to kind of anchor a thought here. The idea that a lagoon can nitrify in the summer doesn't mean it will continue to nitrify in the winter. We're going to be talking more about about microbial activity rates and all of that as, as we dig a little bit deeper here. So these microbes, first off, nitrification, it's the process by which ammonia is converted to nitrites and then nitrates, NO2 and NO3. And uh, the bacteria doing that work for us, it's uh, nitrosomonas, nitrospira, and nitrobacter. Those are the dominant species. Down at the bottom, you can see NH4 ammonia being converted to nitrite, Nitrosomonas is the organism primarily responsible for that, that oxidation, if you will. And then to nitrate with nitrosphere and nitrobacter coming in and accomplishing that work for us. And when we plot this out, when we look at uh, grams of ammonia per square meter of surface area per day, and we plot that against temperature, we can see a, a declining line. And that's very indicative of the idea that microbial activity will double or halve with every 10 degrees of change in temperature. This isn't new. The idea that bugs move faster in warmer water and slower in colder water, not at all new. In fact, there's about 30 years worth of research and academic papers and thousands of installations that all very well establish the, the left side of the chart that's on the screen. What's less well understood is, is the right side of the chart. Once that water temperature dips below about 39.2 Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius, what happens then? Conventional wisdom would indicate that nitrification will slow and all but stop. It will become ineffective. 
facultative systems especially, you are growing a small population of nitrifying bacteria. And that very small population, when you slow it down as the water temperature drops, it's no surprise that you don't see nitrification really continuing. When you, when you build a giant biomass, that's a game changer though, and we're gonna be talking about that in a minute or two here as well. So some studies for you at, at, four, and a, at four to five degrees Celsius, some, some examples of the dozens and dozens of studies that are out there. A bit more sparse when you drop down and you start looking at one degree Celsius, but we're definitely starting to see people looking at that. Triple Point is looking very, very closely at this. And this presentation is geared around the idea that nitrification really does continue all the way down to 1C or, or below. And I've got data coming up to show you that. So talking a little bit more about the bugs, because it's really, really important to, to keep straight what we're talking about. Autotrophic bacteria are the nitrifiers. Uh, an example of some on the left side of the screen and characteristics. They move slowly. They take longer to mature. Uh, they're an attached growth organism. They can't compete very well for food. They're fickle and they have very specific needs. We're going to be talking on the next slide about their oxygen needs and in comparison to our heterotrophic friends over on the right side of the screen. Those are the BOD eaters. They will outcompete the autotrophs in the pond every day of the year if you let them. They're stronger, they're hungrier, they can float freely in the water column, and they just chew through as much BOD as they can get their hands on, which sometimes doesn't leave enough for the nitrifiers, because the nitrifiers, they don't want a lot of BOD around because that attracts heterotrophs. Heterotrophs displace autotrophs, and you know, then your nitrification stops. What they want to see is just a little bit of BOD because they need that to help build their cellular walls. It's a building block for their bodies. So a little bit of BOD and a lot more oxygen. That's, uh, that's the purpose of this slide is to compare uh, the heterotrophs and the autotrophs in terms of the pounds of oxygen per pound of stuff that you're oxidizing. So heterotrophs uh, eating through the biochemical oxygen demand in the pond they're gonna consume roughly one and a half to two pounds of oxygen per pound of BOD. Uh, oh, looking over right next to it for ammonia or autotrophic friends, nitrosomonas, nitrospira, nitrobacter, those guys need a lot more air. So you're up at about 4.6, 4.7 pounds per pound. And you, this shows up in the DO levels that you run. Most typically in a lagoon system, between a half a part and three parts is great for your DO but you can't get great nitrification at that level. You've got to be up in that four to eight milligram per liter level uh, to ensure you're providing sufficient oxygen for nitrification to occur. We know that the biological community consumes large amounts of oxygen, and we know that ammonia removal requires a good bit more oxygen than, aerate, than, than just regular aeration. And that's about the bugs and what they need and what they want and how they work. But I really want to emphasize that bottom bullet there and just state emphatically that providing excess oxygen is just extra expense. If you're running a pond with eight or nine or 11 milligrams per liter of DO, you're not going to get greater nitrification out of that. You're just spending more money. It's, you know, there's the whole saying about hit it with a bigger hammer. You can hit it with a bigger hammer only so far before you're just simply wasting electricity. That's not in anyone's best interest, not even the power companies. So I also have a reminder here that the air that we breathe and that we pump into, we pump into the various diffusers that we use uh, you know, through blowers, it's only about 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and a whole bunch of other stuff just kind of mixed in there for fun. But as you're thinking about SCFM and how much air do I need to provide to get up to you know, a pound and a half or 4.6 pounds. It's important to keep in mind that only about a fifth of the air is actually oxygen. All right, so I promised we would talk more about biomass. And I made a mention of facultative ponds struggling because they wind up with really 
low biomass numbers. Uh, these autotrophs, these attached growth organisms, they need something to cling to. That blue thing down at the bottom, roughly the size of a quarter and about as thick, is an example of a, an ultra high surface area media that we use in our, in our, uh, our MBBRs, our nitroxes, uh, in order to provide lots and lots and lots of surface area for nitrifiers. And guess what? When you provide a lot of surface area for them, when you control the conditions, when you limit the nutrients in entering, when you give them enough of everything that they want, they want 7.1 parts per part of alkalinity. When you give them enough alkalinity, they want 4.6 pounds of oxygen per pound of ammonia. When you give them enough oxygen, you grow these gigantic biomasses. And the small size just maximizes surface area per square foot because we've got so much surface area on the media that we use. We're growing humongous biomasses. And that's resulting in faster treatment kinetics at lower temperatures. So very typically, we're only holding on to the water in our, in our treatment process for about three and a half hours, give or take, at average daily flow. Not a lot of time. Uh, and in very cold water, that's not a lot of time for bugs that are moving slowly to chew their way through, but that's coming up in a couple of more slides. I've got some empirical data to share that shows, shows that. But before we get there, we're going to talk more about the bugs and the size of the biomass that we grow, and we're going to quantify that. So we, we are an inherently inquisitive people, and when we see that we're, we're using lots and lots of surface area, of course we're going to ask ourselves the question, how big of a biomass are we growing? The way that you get to the bottom of that question is pretty expensive testing regimen called microbial community analysis. I'll just jump back here to show that picture of the, uh, of the chip, the uh, media again. And for microbial community analysis, we withdrew a sample of media from cell one, the first treatment cell, where we most typically find nitrosominous. We, we took samples in a couple of different systems, one in Iowa, one in Canada, and we, we shipped them to a lab, preserved them and shipped them to a lab. In that lab, what they did is they scraped the media. They scraped all of that, all of that organic material off of the media and they killed it and they melted it down. And then they went looking for the 16S region of the RNA in the genetic material of these organisms. And by sequencing that 16S region and examining that, the lab is able to identify all of the organisms that are living in this mixed sample. And as you know, if you've ever looked at a wastewater sample under a microscope, you don't see one bug or two bugs or three bugs. You see more things than you can shake a stick at. But when you break it down to the genetic level, you can create a census that will say not only what you have in that water or on that chip, but in what quantity. And of course, it's a snapshot in time, uh, but it's a very valuable snapshot. When we look at the results, what we see over on the right-hand side of the screen, the larger the spot, the larger the trunk, the more prevalent that bacteria is in the sample. And who's the second from the top? It's our buddy Nitrosominus, shown on the left of the screen as well in, a, in an image from Kenyon College. They have a, a great resource out there. It's like Wikipedia, but it's all, all bugs. Nitrosominus, there are a bunch of different views. I like that one the best, so I threw that on the screen for everyone here. But nitrosominus is dramatically overrepresented. And interestingly enough, if you come down to the second from the bottom, that thicker branch off of the main, uh, where you see Pedobacter, Dinobacter, Renala, Flavorobacterium, all of those, those are your, your heterotrophs, the BOD consumers. So this is great empirical evidence saying that we're suppressing those heterotropes. And we're promoting the autotropes, which is exactly what we set out to do and exactly what's needed in order to continue nitrification below that four degrees Celsius number, that, that, that mythical number out there. So we're seeing a gigantic population of nitrosominous growing on a, uh, a pilot sample, biochip media, like you saw on the previous slide, up in Dauphin, which is in Ontario, Canada. 
and on uh, different media, that picture is coming up in a couple of slides, in DeSoto, Iowa, a full-scale system in operation for a couple of years. Uh, design condition there is 630,000 gallons a day. Good bit different than a, than a pilot scale. When we look at this data a little bit differently, what we see is that by optimizing the environment, we're optimizing the bacteria. That nitrosominus is in the center of, of that chart on the, on the center right of the screen. And then on the far right of the screen is an example of uh, media before it was scraped and sent, it, sent to, or before it was sent to the lab and scraped and all of that, what it looks like in, in service. So that nitrosominus line is truncated at 3%, but the reality is it's almost 22%. So think about that line extending off your off the off the monitor that you're looking at or the screen you're watching this on and probably most of the way across the room you're sitting and maybe hitting someone in the head as it goes past. That is a gigantic population of nitrosominus. So comparing a traditional MBBR, one that's set up for BOD removal and seeing some some uh, beneficial but incidental uh, nitrification you'll find less than 2% nitrosominus in, in that MBBR. They're outcompeted. The heterotrophs are going nuts with all the BOD. There's really not a, not a good opportunity for your autotrophic friends to get well-established and nitrify effectively. They're there, they're just relatively ineffective in such low numbers. Dolphin, a pilot, I've got data coming up I'm gonna show you that has startup and performance before or after all that's coming up in a couple of slides. But in Dauphin, that sample yielded about 7% nitrosominous. But look at DeSoto. Look at that mature biomass, that second year system. It's been operating, it's been running, it's been performing beautifully. Lots of data on it is coming up in a couple of minutes here. Almost 22%, approximately 10 times the nitrifier spend in a traditional MBBR. And I, I, I will ask this question just into the ether. Is it any surprise that we're nitrifying in cold water, that the bugs keep active? They don't die off, they keep active, but their activity level drops. Is it any surprise that we can nitrify in cold weather when we're developing 10X the nitrifying bacteria in our process? I think that's a great rhetorical question. bringing DeSoto, Iowa up on the screen so you can see what it looks like now. So on the right, you have pond one, water's entering. You can tell the inlet is that center area of, of the uh, first cell, all the birds around it. Uh, pond two, and then nitrox in pond three for settling. Uh, the nitrox is that little construction that's to the left of the uh, process building that you see there. That's the nitrox process. And all of the nitrification is taking place Substantially all of the nitrification during the winter time is taking place inside of the nitrox. The ponds successfully nitrify during the summertime and it, it doesn't take a lot to get good ammonia numbers off of a lagoon system in summertime. Where they become really, really challenged though is wintertime and that's where a tertiary or an external process becomes very valuable. There are a number of them on the market, but all the data that we're talking about is data we, we've extracted from systems that are operating with our technologies. So looking at some of that data now, let's start with the first year in DeSoto. Let's look at let's look at startup occurring in the fall. So you've got temperatures declining, that's bringing water temperatures down, things are getting colder, bugs are slowing down, all of this taking place as we're starting up the system and trying to grow a biomass to treat treat the ammonia in the wastewater. Uh, if you look on the right side of the screen, you'll note that their permit values, their permit limits are 2.8 milligrams per liter in the winter time and 1.4 in the summertime. And if you look at the bottom of that chart, in the bold, you'll see their averages. Their average is uh, about, a, about 0.8 milligrams per liter winter and about 0.4 milligrams per liter summertime. 0.78 and 0.4 are the numbers that are on there and about sounds like a weird word to use when you're looking at an exact number. But the reason that I say about is because those values are both overstated ever so slightly. Let, let me explain why. And I'm gonna explain on the next slide here. 
So the polar vortex hit, and this is 2019 information now. Uh, you can see the temperatures. The low was 20, negative 26 C, just horribly cold weather there in about 20 miles uh, west of Des Moines, uh, bedroom community, DeSoto, Iowa. They're getting 15 and a half milligrams per liter of ammonia into their uh, system. But what they're putting out is less than 0 0.10 milligrams per liter. Why less than? Because these guys are using a Hawk DR930. And when you get to below detection limits, what displays on the screen isn't BDL. It's less than 0 0.10 milligrams per liter. When I flip back and we look at this data again in the ammonia column, you'll see there are a whole bunch of 0.1s. That's because it's hard to say there's zero. There isn't zero. There's just less than 0.1. There's less than the meter can detect. So in, the rea in reality, uh, our summer and winter performance were actually a little bit better than those numbers. Again, it's just uh, the devil's in the details on this. So they're putting out absolutely beautiful water with an immature biomass. You know, they've got a wintertime limit of 2.8 milligrams per liter. They're putting out 0.78 on average. They're way under their permit limit. Uh, looking at this, at the polar vortex, they're putting out below detection limit that day. That led to a, a fantastic question. Director of Public Works said, hey guys, you know, that thermally regulated piece of the nitrox, I'm spending some money on heat and I'm way over producing on quality. What would happen if we if we turned the heat down or we turned it off? And my God, what a great question to ask. What a wonderful question Dan posed. And as, as we're looking at it, as we're thinking about it, it, it just became so obvious that we need to try this. We've got all this conventional wisdom. Everything suggests that that nitrification will stop if, if that water gets any colder, but yet we're way overproducing. So let's separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit. Let, let's study this some more. Let, let's put a plan into action. Let's shut off the heat and see what happens. And guess what? 98.43% removal is what happens. Our effluent ammonia is one fifth of a milligram per liter. Same statement applies about below detection limits in the data. We're all the way down at 0.2 milligrams per liter with an average influent temperature of only 1.2 Celsius. There are dozens of studies that have been written that say there's no way this could happen, except it does. And it happened every day that winter and it happened every day the next winter. The reality is that these guys have not run the heat in their system in over two years now. They are getting just beautiful effluent off of this system, and they're doing it without adding any heat. And it has everything to do with the size of the biomass. I promised you another picture of media out of, out of one of these MBBRs that we're talking about. That's top right on the screen. Uh, virgin product in front, and then partially occluded with uh, microbial growth um, the image behind it. So this is DeSoto, Iowa, and just beautiful, beautiful performance out of this full-scale system. We're, we're having a completely different set of conversations with them now about uh, the apparatus that was used to heat the water and, you know, when it will be needed. Um, probably as they approach design condition, we'll, that will become a lever that gets exercised, but really time will tell. For now and for the for the near future, uh, we know that we are dramatically overproducing uh, their permit limit, and we're doing it without running the heat. And we're doing that because we have a gigantic, gigantic biomass that 20 almost 22 percent nitrous salmonus that I showed you on the MCA slides. So this is DeSoto. I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about a pilot system in Ontario, in Dauphin, Ontario, next, and that's Dauphin. And here we can see uh, the 2019-2020 winter and how the performance ran. Uh, you can see influent temperatures, you can see the ammonia coming in, you can see the ammonia going out, and it's very, very little, almost no ammonia going out there. Looking at the next year in Dauphin, 
We started out great. Everything was rolling along fine. But what in the world happened on the 17th of November? Look at that. The data is all beautiful. 17th of November, something changed. Data is all out of whack. Something changed back a little bit later in the month, and we see the data recovering. We're going to talk about that. So to talk about that, I need to start by giving you an overview of the system in, in Dauphin. What you have in, on the right side of the screen is this amazing seven cell system. Bottom right is cell one, top right is the final cell and mainly used for storage. Uh, that bottom cell on, on the right there, the operator has the ability to route water almost anywhere he wants within the system. Out of, that, out of that initial aerated lagoon. And, and they do, they have the ability to, to stack water, they have the ability to store, they have the ability to retreat if they don't like how it came out of one pond before it went into another one. And just this phenomenal, phenomenal amount of availability of, of options. So let's talk now about that final cell because that is gonna be very important to understanding what happened on the 17th of November. Our pilot was originally located on the effluent of that cell, top right of, of, of the picture, top right of that storage cell. We were asked to relocate to the bottom right of that same storage cell. And it's a storage cell. If you look at EPA guidance, if you think about Metcalf and Addy, 10 state standards, all of them add up to being about 75% VOD removal taking place in the, in the initial cell, the primary treatment cell. That's a pretty well-established kind of industry standard, if you will. It's normal. 75% or so of whatever is going to be removed is going to be removed in cell one. What we found when we moved our pilot from the top right to the bottom right of that same storage cell, we discovered their BOD was really high, indicating that effective treatment was not occurring in cell one. And that in reality, a tremendous short circuiting uh, was taking place on the system. And the majority of the treatment was actually occurring after all of the treatment cells and in that final storage cell. So what did we do? We moved the pilot back. And as you can see, the data starts recovering. By suppressing the heterotrophs, by not allowing all that BOD into the reactor, we're able to re-preference autotrophic bacteria and minimize heterotrophic in influence in the reactor. And that's the recovery that we saw. That's, that's exactly what happened there. So some conclusions from Dauphin. First of all, uh, confirmed existing research that nitrification continues below 5C. And we confirmed the dominant ammonia oxidizing bacteria species is similar to other 1C studies. And our, uh, our 1C study down, I'm sorry, our full scale, uh, in DeSoto, Iowa. Uh, those MCA results, the microbial community analysis that we looked at, indicates both Dauphin and DeSoto successfully nitrify way below 4C. And Nitrosomonas is the same, same dominant species in the first cell in both locations. That, that, that didn't come as a giant surprise. Uh, when you're controlling conditions and controlling environments, getting similar results and seeing similar bugs is not that unusual, I don't think. And uh, results indicate an abundance of the nitrifying population compared to a conventional system, that, that traditional MBBR at less than 2%. And that's really where this ability to nitrify in cold weather conditions is coming from. It's the size of the biomass. Then a hypothesis down there, and Canadian projects run a little different than, than US-based projects. When we get to go to full scale in Dauphin, our hypothesis is that we're going to see similar performances to SOTA. I should point out, we've got about 30 of these systems in operation around the United States, and we're seeing consistent performance elsewhere as well. So looking at them side by side, comparing these two head to head, if you will. First of all, uh, Dauphin, what, what I find most shocking, and I, I surprise people all the time on this. Interestingly enough, I don't surprise Canadians. They seem to understand the weather patterns, and they, they have a little different opinion of Ontario as a result. It is actually warmer in Canada, up in Ontario, than hundreds of miles south 
in DeSoto, Iowa. You can see that in the average influent temperature. It's more than double uh, what we were seeing in, uh, in Iowa. So flow rate, of course, uh, you're much, much lower. You're at about 0.71 gallons a minute, three quarters of a gallon a minute, roughly, in the pilot system, little scale system running as a pilot. But DeSoto full scale, 158 gallons a minute. And again, their design conditions, uh, 0.63 MGD. And uh, the influent ammonia, a little bit different, a little bit different from these two communities coming in. Uh, the effluent ammonia, not a whole lot different. Both of them are well under permitted limits. Then you've got CBOD and TSS down there also take a look at. Uh, looking at the notes, um, similar to Dauphin, we're seeing uh, lots of ammonia oxidizing bacteria represented as nitrosominous. Th th that's just the main species. And uh, we definitely saw much more nitrosominous in DeSoto than we did over in Dauphin in the pilot, uh, or um, those uh, nitrogen oxidizing bacteria, much smaller there. And uh, higher population in DeSoto, not, not unusual, a full-scale plant, second-year biomass, third-year biomass, not, not at all unexpected to see a much larger, um, much larger biomass than the pilot scale. And uh, then just a note, 1.06 C was our average uh, in-tank temperature. Um, literature would suggest nitrification isn't going to occur, but we've got 98.5, 98.6% removal efficiency. Nitrification absolutely can occur below 4 degrees Celsius. 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit isn't a magic number, and the bugs don't all pack up and go home for the winter. They're still there. They're just not doing as much. So you need a lot more of them to ensure that you meet permit. And we are right at the end of the uh, content section. I, I have a slide here on Laguniversity next. Uh, Laguniversity, it's our response to the pandemic as a give back to the industry, 100% free of charge. Uh, this webinar will wind up on Laguniversity once it gets processed and the quiz and everything gets created. Um, but you can go out and get CEUs, PDHs if you're behind. Do take a careful look, though, because they're not universally accepted, and you'll want to look for, for your regulating body or agency and ensure that whatever state your, your license is under, uh, the webinar that you're looking at is going to qualify you for CEUs or PDHs as appropriate. But that's all on, on Lagoon University, and you can find them there. And then my last slide in the deck is my question and answer slide. Uh, this is the system. It's actually taken. I'm standing on top of the nitrox tanks in uh, Cheryl Crow's hometown. It says it right there on the sign when you drive into DeSoto, excuse me, when you drive into uh, Kennett, Missouri. Uh, so this is the treatment plant in Kennett, Missouri, standing on top of a nitrox. And I, I use this picture for my question and answer slide just because it's a great reminder that the environment is absolutely impacted by what we do. And we, we are privileged to be able to work in and around such, such beautiful natural places as we see. And Eve, I'll ask now if we have any questions. I am not able to hear Eve. Let's see what, uh, I may be able to see the question myself though here. Okay. Uh, first question, what temps do they average in the winter in Iowa? Uh, from Keith. Keith, I'm not sure if you're asking about air or water. Uh, I'll tell you that Iowa water, as we saw in the data, we're all the way down in, in, in the range of a degree Celsius. Uh, we're down at just a couple of degrees Fahrenheit in, in their uh, lagoon water. As far as ambient temperatures, uh, during the polar vortex, we saw they were way, way down. Uh, average wintertime temperatures, uh, typical upper Midwest, you're seeing you're seeing zeros, you're seeing teens, you're seeing some amount of time below zero for air temperatures as well. Uh, and then the next question from Keith was flow. They're at uh, their ADF right now. They're flowing. Uh, they were flowing about 36% of that 630K uh, design. They did a giant INI project and just 
ha had phenomenal results from it. They cut that flow in half, and they're down. They're down now around 85,000 gallons a day for an ADF. Uh, Doug is asking about influent TSS to nitrox. Uh, when we when we work with engineers, we have sort of guidelines of 30 milligrams per liter of BOD and 45 of uh, of TSS. Uh, that's at the inlet. We can adjust if that's higher. If it's lower, um, and this is this is subject of a different conversation, but I'll just tell you that when we're entering at 30 and 45, we're going to see no more than about a 4% rise in TSS through the nitrox. Uh, we have about a 40-page white paper that we can share. If you'll reach out, we'll have a conversation and let you look at all that data. But yeah, uh, influent TSS to the nitrox. Most designs, we ask for 45 milligrams per liter or less. But again, we can work with a little more than that. Um, wow, let's see. Jose is asking about conference papers on DeSoto performance. Um, Jose, reach out. Let's have a conversation about it. I'm happy to introduce. I think I'm I'm probably going to be happy to introduce you to the director of public works there also. He loves to talk about his system. He loves to tell the story. And it is a fantastic story. If you ever get to hear Dan out, he uh, gives conference presentations on his system and all of the struggles that he went through as well. Uh, let's see. I think Eve's answered the question on a certificate. Uh, knife trucks effluent with recirculation presentation for TN removal. Doug, absolutely yes. Reach out. Let's have more of a conversation about denitrification and how that can occur. Uh, definitely happy to dig into that discussion with you as well. A uh, comment on potential commissioning challenges at DeSoto. Jose, I'm, I may need to just simply chat with you to go go through that and better understand the question. Uh, did we, Keith is asking about E. coli less in this system than normal. I know you say you can't treat E. coli, but it, does it somehow reduce the levels? Keith, that's a really interesting question. I don't know that we've we've directly studied that because uh, disinfections generally out of our outside of our scope of work on projects. Uh, I can tell you that the 254 nanometer wavelength does great great jobs with uh, E. coli chlorination dechlorination is of course another common disinfection strategy. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I just I don't know that I can comment on E. coli, but uh, we captured emails, I believe, and I'll, I'll dig a little deeper and reach out for you. Uh, question on slides, Gerald, reach out. I'm happy to happy to talk to you about the slides. Best media to use in nitrifying MBBRs. This is a question from Beta. Uh, Beta, that's a really interesting question, and I'll tell you that uh, it, it's a it's a longer conversation than I think we have time for. Uh, but with what's going on right now in the world and the supply chain disruptions, uh, looking at about 75% of the polyethylene used in the United States coming out of Texas, we have been looking at other options for MBBR media. Uh, but what we're using is stuff that's traditionally marketed and has been marketed. Uh, nothing that we're using is a new product. Uh, we only will use a, a products that have a nice long track, track record. Uh, that blue biochip that you saw, uh, there's about 25 years of, uh, of case study information available on that media, specifically in MBBRs. Uh, Florencia, if you'll ask again, if you'll just shoot an email on that, we can figure out some slides for you. Uh, Keith says no disinfection, so maybe Keith, we should have a conversation. I, I, I want to help understand your question a little bit. Excuse me. I need to understand your question a little better so that I can properly answer that. And let's see, Gabrielle says, so ideally you would want to reduce short circuiting from previous lagoons. Short circuiting is the enemy of good lagoon performance and for many, many reasons. Uh, lots of material on our website that talks a lot about sludge and short circuiting and the impacts it has. Uh, but short circuiting is unambiguously bad for treatment because it means that you're not allowing uh, that parcel of water. You know, think about that that individual flush. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow a Steve Harris term here. Think about that happy meal. 
uh, that individual happy meal as it travels through the system and gets consumed. Um, short circuiting, you have less time. When you have less time, you have less treatment. Uh, provide sufficient surface area for the biomass, but would recirculating from the bioreactor back to upstream stages help maintain the activity in the biomass and help keep temperatures higher? Uh, so yes and no. You definitely see benefit from recirculating uh, if you have the ability to recirculate a, uh, a portion of that water, you definitely see some uh, some beneficial denitrification taking place. You're not creating an MLSS and and you know feeding feeding that activated sludge back. It's it's not that rich what would, what you would recirculate. But that said, it is definitely helpful. Uh, temperatures you're not looking at sizes and volumes. It's going to be uh, an insignificant contribution to bring warmer water, if it's warmed in the nitrox, it's an insignificant contribution to bring that water back to the head of the plant. You just have so much thermal dissipation based on the size of the receiving body that it, it becomes largely irrelevant. Uh, looks like two more questions on here, and we are just about out of time, so I'm going to see if we can talk through these. Uh, do you need polishing after the nitrox? And what can you do about a TN limit? Uh, I apologize, I'm not going to mispronounce a name. Uh, so Miss B, I, I'm taking that as female name, Miss B. Uh, do you need polishing after the nitrox? That's a really interesting question, and it depends. Uh, so if you've got a TSS concern, uh, if algae is present in your pond, it'll largely pass through the nitrox. And if you have a need to drop that TSS before discharge, it's beneficial to have a settling cell after the nitrox. Uh, you can also address that with, um, with filtration. Uh, you can use cloth or cloth disc, uh, drum filters, media filters. Five to 10 micron looks like about the right, the mi right micron rating um, in order to do that final polish. Uh, also, if disinfection is needed, UV and, and chlorination, dechlorination, we see these all the time after our systems. And as far as a TN limit, that's a much longer conversation than we have time for. But if you'll reach out to me on email, I'll, I'll provide some more information about something that we do produce uh, called Nitrox Plus D. The D is denitrification. And to hit a total nitrogen limit, most times we do need to take that extra step of denitrifying. And we talked a lot about heterotrophs being BOD eaters, autotrophs as attached growth organisms. Uh, you know, the, they're the ammonia oxidizing bacteria that we need. But it's another type of heterotroph that comes back into the conversation when we're denitrifying. But it's a heterotroph that needs really low oxygenation or they get outcompeted very quickly. So in denitrification, we'll add a zone, we'll add another tank, if you will, on the end of our system, and we'll suppress the DO. We'll drive it all the way down to about a half a milligram per liter. We'll add a carbon source, and that'll provide the, the food that's needed for those bugs to grow. And then the, as they chew through that product of denitrification, the nitrate, they're releasing, they're off-gassing. They're releasing nitrogen gas into the environment. And if you remember that little on the corner of my, uh, my uh, air demand slide, about 85% of the environment's nitrogen, so there's no problem whatsoever to off-gas nitrogen. That's denitrification after a nitrox, uh, if TN is a concern. Hopefully I've answered everyone's questions. We are right at time, so it, it's time to end the, the webinar. But I, I want to thank everyone for your participation. I want to remind you that uh, certificates are going to be sent out automatically. If you don't get one, reach out to eve at lagoons.com or reach out to me. And we, we love putting these on. We hope you'll visit us on Lagooniversity. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a future presentation. And thank you again.